Hello everyone and welcome to Max Sports My Motivation campaign. My name is Marie Crow and I'm delighted to be joined by Dublin footballer Philly McMahon. We're going to chat about how he's coping with life during COVID-19. Philly, you're very welcome and I like, you know, it is strange times for everyone. We're just trying to get used to this new normal life. What's it like? What's it been like for you? Uh, it's been strange. I think that's the word that I think most people are using. It's strange. It's different. Um, and I suppose as Irish people, we don't really like different that much or change. So, um, but yeah, no, like, I mean, I suppose the big thing when we, the big change was obviously from a, a professional point of view and a sporting point of view. Um, that obviously we, we had to stop training as a team with Dublin and Byron Kickhams. And as a profession, uh, I'm in the fitness industry, so my gym had to shut down. And we had to we had to shift uh, everything online now. So uh, it's it's been it's been learning experience, like I suppose. And I'm very lucky that I suppose I've been given a set of values when I've grew where, the way I've grew up, my parents and stuff like that, the way they've um, brought me up, and that there's always an opportunity in everything. So I suppose from the point of view of all avenues of my life, sport, business, social, the social work I do, uh, it's looking at the opportunity in a in a good way everybody's in a different situation and there are different challenges and you outlined a few of them there and some of them are business, some of them are training. For you, what's been the, the toughest thing that you've had to overcome in these last few weeks in, in, in adapting to where we are now? I'd say from a business point of view, the, diff, the most difficult thing would have been to have them to shut the doors. Um, a lot of my members join my gym because of the people. That's, our, that's a unique selling point, basically. It's, it's the, the members, the staff and the environment. And that's very hard to replicate online. You know, you can do Zoom classes and stuff like that, but it's not. It's just not the same. So unfortunately, over the, the, the last couple of months, we've seen a drop off in revenue, a drop, a drop off in members. And we've had, very luckily, we've had the support of a core group of members who have, uh, I suppose, financially had been able to support us. Some, some weren't able to support us, obviously, because they had lost their jobs and everything else which we respect. But with that uh, support, that's, that's given us a massive help because although we've stopped uh, most of our overheads in terms of our wages, <clears throat> all the staff went on the COVID-19 payment. Um, the other side of it was that we had to keep paying rent and the landlord unfortunately couldn't give us a rent freeze. So we've had to pay rent. <clears throat> um, and with that bit of revenue, that's helped us massively. <clears throat> so that was quite difficult. And then I'd had to take on the onus of, I suppose, the, the five staff members we've had to try to keep that rent coming through, to deliver that service that's online. Um, and I've had, to do, I've had to do all the hours and, and I suppose, the grind of, of keeping it alive. So that's been very difficult. I'm very lucky now that the staff have started to get back involved and, and give us a bit of support as well. <clears throat> Having your own training that you need to do kind of away from that, like your, your training with, with Dublin football, has that kind of helped keep you motivated and, and just kind of keep you in the zone when you have another focus as well and something that you have to do? Yeah, again, going back to that kind of point of making an opportunity out of it, like <clears throat> we play for, our season basically starts in, it starts kind of second or third week in January and training wise and then that's our pre-season we've only a two week run in because we take our team holiday at the end of December and the start of January where most teams are training the month ahead of us so the league is kind of gives us a, a bit of a, a platform to develop our fitness but now that the league is, has stopped I think I suppose players all over the country regardless are, are you know looking at you know getting physically better you know and then what it comes down to is how the team plays collectively and you know, technically the, the, the style of the, of the team and how the players play. So I'm very, again, it's, it's a good probably industry to be in to, to cross over in terms of sport and, and business because like I'm, I've done a 10 o'clock kind of mobility circuit today and I'm doing it live and I'm getting the best of both worlds. So I'm, I'm kind of feeding the customers and giving them content and at the same time I'm benefiting from it. And then there's days where I'm doing three or four workouts and I'm absolutely wrecked. And I hope that progressive overload eventually will, will have a benefit to it. But it's been nice to have the extra bit of training. The other side as well is when you've had 12, 13 years of, you know, going to work at a certain time 
and then finishing at a certain time. And throughout the whole time frame, thinking of what you're doing to prepare yourself for training that evening, that's that can be robotic in a way, like, and it can be tough on your, you know, it's years and years of doing it. You know, I'm, I'm training at seven o'clock tonight. Right, what's my diet like? What's my rest like? What am I doing at work? What's training going to be like? Not having to do that is being is being refreshing, like, you know, to be able to go, do you know what, I'm going to go out for a run, which I've done my mobility sick and I went for a run, and I'm not worried too much about being fatigued because of training this evening, like, so that's been nice. So are you coming home after the run then and having a pizza, or are you sticking to the good nutrition as well? Uh, like, I mean, again, I'm trying to drop my body, I'm trying to get better, my me, me body composition a little bit better, I suppose, in the next, probably if we're going to go back training in phase two or phase three in small groups, I think we're allowed in, in phase three in groups of four. I want to be in, in decent nick going back. But also, you know, I'm one of those, I have to kind of go 80-20, you know, like where I eat healthily enough 80% of the time, but I, I 20% of the time I'd have the odd cheat meal or cheese snack or whatever, like, you know. So it's nice to have that balance, and I'd recommend everybody to have that balance, you know having those two personalities clash of the fat and skinny person in your brain is not good for you because you see so many times people that are 100% on a certain diet or 100% eating healthy food just doesn't last, it's not sustainable. So that's the way my diet has always been. I think um, I, would, I would monitor my food a good bit, but it's just trying to up, up me training load that I hope is going to help me body composition before we get back. So a lot of people who are in the same situation as you are elite athletes, uh, inter-county footballers, hurlers, professional athletes as well, are using this time to try and work on some part of their game and improve on different areas. Is there anything that you're working on that you're specifically going to use this time to, to try and better? Yeah, I think it, it certainly, um, it, there's, there's certain things you can work on. And then there's certain things you can't, obviously, because you don't have the the collective training approach, I suppose. So, yeah, I'm trying to obviously maintain fitness levels or increase fitness levels, but not um, get to the extent where I want to be, you know, at my peak now, because there's no point being fit now. Uh, and I, I suppose I'm working on all aspects, you know, maintenance in terms of strength, power, body composition, my fitness, my speed. Uh, I do a lot of speed and agility stuff as well because I am a defender. I'd have to work on that a lot. So, um, and it's something sometimes you don't get to do that often in training unless it's just through matches or through training itself subconsciously. Like you know, so to break it down, look at the biomechanics of how you move and how you mark players and stuff like that. I think that's definitely something that I can do that doesn't have too much of an effect physically on the body. That you know, not not you know, I can do me, me me kind of fitness stuff as well along with it. And what about the skills of the game? Are you spending much time out and about with the ball? Yeah, it would be. I, like today, I would have, um, you know, it, it's quite hard when you're out training on your own, like, because the ball doesn't come back to you that often. I wish the flats were still there, be able to kick the ball off the flats. But, um, yeah, no, I, I, I would. I'd practice um, between my runs. I'd practice me, me bit of shooting. Uh, it's, like, it's, 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 it's still difficult to, to work on the basic skills of what really my game is about in terms of tackling um, you know the technical side of things can be quite difficult to do at the minute but shooting yeah definitely definitely doing a bit of shooting um, soloing the ball and, and little kind of skills work against the wall and stuff like that I've done a little bit of that but it's again it'll keep you kind of ticking over but I don't think it's going to have you you know it's not going to be make you an unbelievable football going back considering you have to get back to the stage where you're playing with other players and, and there's, there's, there's kind of tactics towards it as well. You mentioned the tackling there and we're all quite concerned about how contact sports are going to work with uh, restrictions in place, social distancing. Tackling is something I don't know how that would work, Philly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that is going to be difficult. And you, you see there yesterday, unfortunately, um, China has had a resurgence of, of uh, cases like as well. So, it's it's worrying, like you know. Um, the GA have been extra cautious, obviously, in putting the the dates back in terms of what the government has suggested. So, 
that's all they can do. And I think it's it's one of those things that you just have to wait and see um, to see how, how quickly we, we constant, well, we've got quickly we get back to normal, first of all, and how we maintain and uh, contain what's happening. Uh, I think that's going to be key to us going back playing. Like, obviously, they have said that what they can do is, you know, test you before training or test you every couple of training sessions or before matches. And um, that's really all they can do. Like, I mean, I do a lot of work in, uh, in the prison service and um, I was down in Midlands Prison there two weeks ago, last week or the week before, I think it was. And, and that's the same thing. When you're going into a prison, they check your temperature, they ask you a couple of questions about symptoms and, um, and if you haven't got them, then that's okay. Off you go, go in and do your job. But if you do, then no, you can't come in here. Like so, but you can't do that with with, with crowds. You can do that with players, all right. And it would be time consuming, um, and it would be a way of kind of containing it. But you know, intercounty football is obviously it's very little without fans and crowds, and you know, and that's what uh, for me makes the inter-county scene so you could probably get away with club scene and um, that that could possibly happen and again once you have them guidelines in place where four matches players don't see, don't seem to have any of the symptoms that could work would you feel comfortable going back playing when social distancing measures are, are still there and, and we don't have a vaccine would i feel comfortable uh, i've seen i've heard a lot of players saying no um you know, there's a lot of people that like we would like if, if I played a match this weekend and I contracted COVID nineteen, it's very very easily spread into our work life. You know, so if I go back to my gym and I'm in a in a class, you know, that could ultimately spread into my class and ultimately my 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 gym could close down. So there is huge risks towards the the rewards, um, but. For me, it's kind of like, when do we ever go back then, if that's the case, you know? Um, you know, obviously, as the time goes on, things will get better. But who knows when there's going to be a cure? Like, we, we can't probably just completely stop playing sport till a cure comes along. So it's juggling that those two things um, that I don't have an answer for. Would I love to go back playing? Yes, jeez, I'd love to go back today. But... We're not, we're, as, as it's being mentioned before, we're not professional athletes. We're amateurs. We do have careers outside that. Whereas if you were an, a, a professional, well, then you could contain it a little bit better. Like. The flip side of all the risks that we speak about regularly is that there are a lot of benefits as well to team sports and to even just having grounds opened up for young people to go. People who are in rural areas where the GA club is such a big part of their community, them not having that, obviously has a big effect on mental health and, and just even trying to, to keep people motivated every day, having something to look forward to is important as well. But I guess the big thing is sport has so many benefits, Philly. Yeah, sport is massive. And it's only when something like this happens that you realise how it affects people's lives. Um, I've, I've been very lucky to understand that from you know, 2017, um, when, you know, my, when we win the, when we, generally in an all Ireland final, after we, we won them, my dad would come down to the turnstile, down to the, the, the barrier at the, the, uh, the stand, and I'd run over and hug him and, and everything else, but 2017, he couldn't do it, I had to stay up in the stand, he was diagnosed with cancer, he's terminally ill, I had to get up and, and go through the crowd, we we're playing Mayo, um, and give him a hug like and I could see the, the energy I gave him and then to look you know to think about the other people not you know there's people that struggle with that are ill that are mentally ill um, those people are probably the ones that really benefit hugely from that release of sport and then there's other people that um, it's it's just something that they love watching um, or supporting or it's being you know part of their heritage it's being you know passed down from generations and then you have the young kids who um, I really feel sorry for right now because we do know that domestic violence, we can see it sporadically 
if you watch the TV, you watch, you know, advertisement, there's, there's some ads around domestic violence now and they're doing that for a reason. There's something happened, like there's, there's, there's issues there, like <clears throat> the cases are increasing, I think. And that's maybe where they're doing some campaigns around it. So that generation can be hugely affected by this period because when you have domestic violence in the home or the, or, or the young kid is exposed to drink, drug and alcohol abuse, um, in the home, <clears throat> well, and that kid is highly likely to go down that generational cycle of crime addiction, end up in prison, have a kid at a young age. So sport is huge in that. Sport is massive. Um, the effects it has on the social um, side of, of, of our living and also um, the exchequer has a huge impact on, you know, if these kids go down that route, we certainly know that they'll cost um, the country a lot of money. Uh, whether they go to prison or whether they go through certain services, this is what's going to happen, you know. So it's a worrying time for me. It's That's an area that I'm really passionate about. I'm probably, uh, in that, I would be classed as an activist in around at-risk youths and drug addiction. Uh, my charity focuses on the halftime talk, focuses on at-risk youths and drug addicts. So <clears throat> it's going to be um, really important that we try to get back to sport as say you know in a safe manner but as quick as possible and even for you philly when you think that your whole life gaelic games have been such a big part of it and, and a huge part of your identity it must be so strange now not to have that in your life and and just your everyday existence yeah it is it is um you know from the age of eight or nine to where i am now um I mean, even just going out and kicking a ball, you know, in a park doesn't really, doesn't really feel like you're playing Gaelic football. Like you know, you're doing the skills and everything else, but it just doesn't feel the same. So I don't know what to say about it. It's just a bit strange. Um, you know, the people that you meet, very, you know, obviously we're meeting very few people now because we're not able to go a certain distance. But even when you're speaking to people, it's you're recognised as a GAA player. But I suppose for me, again when I developed a purpose in life and I set up my charity, I always wanted to branch out of who I am, not just to be defined as a footballer. <clears throat> so if you're a player, if you're an inter-county player out there, wherever county you're from, and you're defining yourself as a footballer, you're probably struggling right now. You're probably struggling a lot now. Uh, whereas I wasn't, you know, I had, the bu I had my business to focus on. I have the social project I'm running, I'm, I'm doing at the minute, um, I'm kept busy, like, you know, which is, which is great. And I suppose that helps, you know, fill that void, the, that, the void that's being emptied now in terms of not playing GA. And if people are struggling, then what advice would you have for them? Well, look, we know that in terms of mental health, that we have nine kind of uh, contributors to, it, to, to our mental health in terms of the depression and anxiety. We know that seven of those are social social contributors I and mean, we know two of them can be biological it can be genetically okay so i think we gotta i suppose realize that this again going back to the point that i'm trying to get across all the time is this opportunity of you know this could help you understand yourself a little bit better your life a little bit better and others you know so there can be a huge benefit to this horrible thing that's happened to the world, like you know, it's there's no getting away from the devastation it's caused on families, the the, the loved ones of of the people that have, that have passed, um, and you know, as we've mentioned, the mental health issues it's going, to, it's caused and it's going to cause. But if we can always think that there's an opportunity in in something so negative, eventually, eventually there will be, you know, there's no doubt that people will learn like you know that we can that we we can we need to spend more time with each other we need to speak to each other more we need to reach out to each other even more and it's just one of those things when something's taken from you that you miss that you want to do so much like if you go to prison and liberty's taken you want it back that's the only thing you want and in many ways the world is being imprisoned and hopefully you know like when prisoners come out of prison they really are grateful for the things that they have in life. And, and that's the way we can think of it. You know, that we have been imprisoned in many ways, 
that we can do certain things and that when we come out we should be moving forward in that direction of looking at making sure that the humanity point of view is more connected than ever before because they're very lonely we think we're the most connected generation that's ever been on this planet but we're actually the opposite we're, we're quite lonely like we, we've lost all our tribes from a very young age from you know primary school how many of those do you actually hang around with still how many do you pal around with? how many do you ring that used to you know that's you know when you played sport as a kid you know how many of those guys are you hanging around with or girls are you hanging around with right now or have you met have you rang during the week and even your family like even to going for a family meal sitting down and having a meaningful conversation we are starting to lose that tribe you know our, our nephews and nieces and young, young uh, family members when they sit down to have a meal and i do it the phone comes out straight away and you're not there you're not you're not there 100 percent. so i really do think that technology is can be very positive but there's also a really negative you know component to it but this can help us this this essentially could help us be more connective uh, in terms of who we are. And people are going to have good days and bad days, and I'm sure they are, and struggling to even get up and go out for a walk. How do you stay motivated all the time or as often as you can to get up, get out, do some exercise, do your training, do what you need to do? Uh, well, I live, by, I live by a philosophy called the power of choice, which is basically... I decide how I feel and don't feel. Um, so when I get out of bed and I put my feet on the ground and it's a new day, um, I kind of self-assess where I am. So everybody does it physically. You get out of bed and you go, oh, my back's a bit sore or my hip or trained last night and a bit stiff. But very rarely do you get out and go, how do I feel mentally? You know, do you really self-assess or are you self-aware of your psychology? And for me, that's where I need to, that's, that's my starting point. So if you're somebody that's having a bad day, it's just, it's just a, a, you need to realize that it's just a problem that needs to be solved. So when you have negative emotions, in other words, a bad day, there's a problem there that needs to be solved. And when you solve that problem, what happens? You get positive emotions. So we need to stop chasing this positivity. And it's paradoxical. You need to realize that when you accept negativity, the outcome is positive. So my brother John passed away, he struggled with addiction, and I'm able to speak, use my sporting profile to speak to young people to knock her down that route. So that was a negative thing, but the outcome eventually, when I got through that process of grieving, was positive. No different to somebody losing weight, they look in the mirror, they feel, when they look at themselves naked in the mirror, that they feel uncomfortable, and they, all the emotions of that really affects them. They go and join the gym, they get results, and the outcome is positive. But there's pain and suffering in, in everything that's worthwhile. So for me, the power of choice. When you wake up in the morning, how do you feel physically? How do you feel mentally? And then what's your trigger to kickstart your day? Because it takes you just one choice. And then the next choice is going to have a, a snowball effect. So if you, if you um, do something positively from the beginning, the next one will be positive. If you ever hear that, you know, you hear the saying, getting, out, getting out, outside the wrong side of the bed. You've heard that one, like. So, like, when you do that, the first thing, because you're feeling so bad, the first thing you want to do is eat bad food because you think that makes you feel good. And then the outcome of that is that you feel bad. And that's a snowball effect the opposite way. The first person you see then, you're going to be negative and, you know, you're just going to be the person that you, you don't want to be. And that's basically, and throughout the day you'll do that. Throughout the day you get worse and worse and worse. Your energy will be sapped and you just become cranky. Whereas when you're looking to motivate yourself it takes one choice and it starts in the morning it could be making your bed the trigger it could be having a glass of water it could be walking your dogs it could be got it could be movement light it could be a uh, chore any of those things can, can kick start your day to being something really positive positive. and philly when we do get back to some sort of normal life whatever that might look like and hopefully it will involve sports of, of some type anyway what are you most looking forward to um, I suppose I'm looking forward to seeing the benefits of the training that I've done, the physical side of things, uh, the banter in the change rooms, missed that terrible, missed the lads terrible. Um, from 
the my family and loved ones perspective it's it's trying to get better at spending good quality time with them um again going back to that point of meaningful energy with my family don't care about the amount of time it's not really about that it's it's the the good quality time that i want to spend with them uh because i haven't been given that opportunity that maybe a lot of people have where they, they're spending loads of time with their loved ones now uh, i haven't because i've been working so much because i've been trying to keep the business alive so i'm hoping that i can le- take a few learnings from that side of things that's going to be very very um very important and then from the business point of view obviously to keep trying to generate our uh with a new revenue stream in terms of online training so looking at that opportunity that's worked really well we've done a we started a new uh, challenge like it's like the top gear fastest track type thing with true fitness uh, and we've got loads of influencers on uh, which has been amazing so far so We've got Greg O'Shea, Anna Geary, Sean O'Brien, Rory Story, Brennan Brogan. There's been loads. Uh, James Gallagher, Siobhan O'Hagan. And uh, yeah, there's loads doing it. So it's brilliant. And they're basically competing against each other. It's great crack. So that has been kind of eye-opening for me and the other staff members that this time of the year, I wouldn't have been able to do that because I was playing football. So being able to focus on developing the online presence has been a big learning, learning thing that I'm definitely going to carry on when we get back to normality. And when we do get back and you put on that blue jersey once again, is it going to make you want it more, do you think, now that you've it's been taken away from you without anyone even expecting it? Definitely. Like for me, <laughs> this stage of uh, my career as well, I'm not, I'm not one of the young, young lads anymore. So, yeah, I definitely won't be taking it for granted. Every chance I get on that pitch, I'm going to love it and enjoy it. Like, you know, so um, I would have already had that before the lockdown because again as i said the stage of my career but for me um yeah it's gonna be it's gonna be something that i really really will look forward to like you when it's take as i said to you when it's taken away from you it's one of those things that you just you crave so much you know well i'd say desi farrell that'll be music to his ears Finny mcmahon thanks so much for joining us thanks very much